All right, so today, um, we're going to talk about something called probability mass. Probability density functions here, we'll call both of those things. They're both the same thing. Um, they're just probability distributions. It's stuff you know. Like I said, I've said before, it's stuff you know. We're just doing it in a little bit of a different way. So um, let's slow it. You can plot the probability of any given score, any given value of variable. That's just a thing you can do. One can do that. Now, the probability of all possible events is one. Because probabilities can't go any higher than one. If a probability that you've calculated is higher than one, you've made a mistake. It is impossible it would be higher than one because it's out of one. Right? It's like how correlations can't be bigger than 1.0. It's just, it's the way the math works. It can't happen. When I taught 21, 26, I would always trip people up on which correlation is bigger. Negative 0.7, positive 0.4, or 1.6. But well, 1.6 isn't a correlation, so we can throw that one out. Same thing here. You can't get a probability bigger than 1. But if you got all the events, all the possible events, the probability of all of those together is 1. Right? You know this. If you didn't know it, now you know it. So that means the area under that curve, if we're plotting probabilities, if on the y-axis we have probabilities, and on the x-axis we have the values, that means the area under that whole curve is equal to 1. Does that follow? That makes some, I hope that makes some sense, right? So if we were to calculate the area under the curve, it equals 1. It's because it's probability, and the probability of all the possible events equals 1. Well, what else could it be? If it's less than 1, you don't have all the events. And if it's greater than 1, well, it can't be. You've made a mistake. Okay. Do you have any questions? This is kind of important. So here's our roll of a die. The various probabilities of the different die rolls. Now, I will say that let's ignore the widths here. Yeah. Well, they're one unit across. And they're 0.167 high. They're 0.167 high. Because the, each, the probability of each roll of a die is one in six. Uh, a six-sided die. Not a 22-sided die, and I'm going to roll my character, not that kind of die. Right? <laughs> Grow up. I kid, I kid. I, I don't play those games, so I, mock, I play other games. I play games where I pretend I run the Montreal Canadiens. So it's perfectly, that's perfectly sane. Huge free agent signing sign, T.J. Oshie. Yep. I also pretended yesterday to be a soldier in World War I for a while. Also pretend to be an assassin. <laughs> but pretend but but Dungeons and Dragons is stupid. So <laughs> all that other stuff is completely manly and cool and grown up. So the thing I'm kidding. <coughs> My daughter plays those games, it's great. I think it's wonderful. I, I just never could get into it. It's fine. But it's a six sided die. Each rule is equally likely. One in six by one six seven. We take one, that's one six, two six, three six, four six, four, six sixths. Ooh, that's one. Where is six six six? <laughs> uh, I just had fun. I, I don't really care. Um, I was going to start doing an Iron Maiden thing there. I decided to cancel it wisely. Okay, this is great. Does that make sense, right? Okay. So that's the last time you graphed the likelihood of rolling a dot. No, you didn't. Good. That makes you, that's, you know, you're a loser. The other kids let you know it if you're doing that. But the normal distribution's cool as far as distributions go. So here it is. Uh, it's got mu in the middle with zero. This is standard normal distribution. So it's, it's mean of zero and a variance of one. So plus or minus one standard deviation is about 
uh, once a year, yeah, is about 68%, plus or minus two standard deviations, about 95%, plus or minus three standard deviations is about 99.7%. Which, it's called the, it's got a name, right? that's a Russian guy's name, it's some, somebody's rule. I call it the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule, because I'm never gonna remember the guy's name. Put that over there, a little smaller. The most common, or at least the most useful de distribution to us is this. <coughs> we kind of sell you on the notion that this is the most common one. I don't know that as many things that we say in statistics books are normally distributed actually are. There's no way that the life of light bulbs is normally distributed. Because that would be really shitty quality control, wouldn't it? The, the ones that are down here that only last like 20 minutes, those don't get out of the factory when close. Where that people stop buying those uh, those light bulbs. It's a good story. But it's certainly most useful for us, because theoretically it's useful. It has certain characteristics. Like any distribution. It's, it's got, a, uh, we can talk about its, its uh, shape, so it's unimodal and symmetrical. Right. It's got one mode. Mode, the most useless measure of central tendency. It's symmetrical, as I mentioned, and it's bell-shaped, to be okay. I see why they say that. You know this. That's the thing you've learned before. Okay. So that's all great. You've all learned this before about the normal distribution. It's, it's run, you've run into it before. Why is it actually useful for us to know about the normal distribution, I guess is the question. Many variables are assumed to be normal in the population. I'm not sure if they really are. As much as you <coughs> think they are. I think we could probably fairly say that human height is normally distributed. It's probably true. I think the probability of being seven feet tall is probably about the same as being about four, foot, four and a half feet tall for an adult. It's probably about the same. There's not a lot of people who are seven feet tall. I, I read an interesting uh, article about this at uh, 538, which is a website that talks, it's data journalism. And they said that if you're over seven feet tall and you're American, there's a 16% chance you play in the NBA. That's how few seven foot tall people are. There's a lot of four and a half foot tall. So you think about that. There's 12 guys on each team. There's what, 30 teams in the NBA? About maybe two seven footers on each team. Perhaps that's 60 people. So that means there's only like 300 people, 350 people in the whole United States that are over seven feet tall. That are adults. It's probably the same as about that many people who are uh, probably even under four feet tall. But who are adults? Yeah, I guess it's distributed. I guess height's okay. I think life expectancy is probably like how long you live, like life expectancy, or how long, the ultimate dependent variable, age and death. That's probably not distributed. Some people live really long and some people die. Infants. Okay, this gets impressive. We went from people playing professional basketball to dead babies. Um, so that's sad, and I feel bad, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got children. I'm human. So the nice thing about this, though, not the dead baby thing, but the nice thing about the, uh, oh, this, dude, this, I am weird. The nice thing about the, you know, there used to be a kind of joke in the, in the 60s, dead baby jokes. Did you know that? Yeah, it was the thing. Yeah. It's weird. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it was the thing. Anyway, we use standard techniques because of the commonness, commonness, commonality, commonality of the normal distribution. Okay. So we, this distribution was discovered by this guy uh, Gauss. Yeah. So he discovers this thing, and it's really common, and it can then be used in all kinds of statistical things. Now, the nice thing is sampling distributions are normal. The sampling distribution of the mean, at least, is normal. The central limit theorem, or the CLT, tells us that. Right? 
And the, we, the neat thing about this is that the sampling distribution of the mean, which is just all the values the mean can take with a given n. If I was to, to flip, now let's go with roll a die. If I have to roll a die 10 times, now each die roll is equally likely, isn't it? So we have the ultimate sort of uniform variable. Great. Roll the die. And I roll it 10 times. And I take the average roll. On average, I'm going to get about three and a half. Right? Because it's in the middle. Sometimes I will roll 10 times and I will get one. In other words, I'll get 10 ones. Sometimes I'll get 10 sixes and I'll get 16, so divided by 10 is six. Sometimes I'll roll a one, a two, and then eight more ones. Sometimes I'll roll two ones, and then a two. Sorry, I shouldn't say seven. And seven more. And sometimes with three, so that's a little more likely. Then it becomes a lot more likely to roll something closer to a three. But right, three and a half is the most common thing I'm going to get. It's even true. That's a little abstract, though. It's hard thinking about that. What about flipping a coin? If I flip a coin, what's the probability of getting a head or a tail? It's 50-50, right? Okay, very good. Now, <coughs> let's say 10 coin flips. And we're going to assign a value of 1 to a head and 0 to a tail. 1's a head, 0's a tail. If I flip a coin 10 times, sometimes I'm going to get all heads. going to happen. It's not going to happen very often, but it's going to happen. Sometimes I'm going to get all tails. Sometimes I'm going to get... That's pretty unlikely. Where's the chalk? I'm going to do it here. So, sometimes I'm going to get all heads and no tails. Oh, sorry, all tails and no heads. Cause, uh, yeah, because I said heads was uh, one. Sometimes I'm going to get all tails, all heads and no tails. Sometimes all tails and no heads. Then sometimes I'm going to get nine and one or one and nine. Sometimes I'm going to get two and eight, eight and two. Sometimes I'm going to get three and seven or seven and three, and so on. But the neat thing is, the most common thing I'm going to get is five heads and five tails. You can actually do this yourself, by the way. You take a die and roll it 20 times. This would be a lot of free time. I don't know students are really, they have no other work to do. So get out a die and just roll it 10 times and take the average of that roll, then do it again and do that 100 times. So again, a lot of free time, and I guess you don't have Netflix. So, you know, or anything else. But if you do this and then you plot it out, you'll actually get the normal distribution. It's kind of creepy. It's creepy in that you wouldn't expect that to happen. The nice thing is this is all based on a theorem in mathematics that's completely provable, the central limit theorem. It's very neat, actually. The central limit theorem actually says that the, the sampling distribution of the mean is normally distributed with a mean of mu sub x. That's the average, so the average, the average average you're going to get is the population. And it's going to have a standard deviation of sigma divided by the square root of the number of observations. Now, I can't easily explain to you why it's divided by the square root of the number of observations. But I can <coughs> explain to you why, think about this. <coughs> The variance of this thing is going to get smaller and smaller the bigger n gets. Because remember, this is the variance of, well, something like this, the average of the averages you take. Right? I mean, it's all me, but I'm just going to say Because nobody's been here since yesterday. Okay. So this, this part's easy to get, the normal, because 
talk about that. This part's easy to get the mean because, yeah, it's most common one for the for the uh, variable itself. It's going to be the most common uh, value for the sampling distribution. I mean, for the standard deviation, why is it that? Well, like I said, it's hard for me to explain without doing a proof that I'm not going to do and probably can't remember how to do anyway. This to prove that it's divided by square root of n. But what happens to bigger n gets? The variance of the sampling of, 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 of the sampling distribution is smaller. See if this makes any sense to you. What happens? You know what that means? Take the limit of sigma over square root of n as it approaches infinity. You guys, take, you guys learned that in math one time ago. If you didn't, it's okay. I'm going to explain it. But if you took some math, you know what that means already. What does this value become sigma over root n as n gets infinitely large? If n is infinitely large, what's something divided by an infinitely large number? Zero. Right? If I have a, a number that's so big you can't even imagine it, and I divide some number by some number that's so big you can't even imagine it, it's zero. The fraction is so small that, is, that it, 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 as this, as n approaches infinity, this thing, zero. Okay, you might think, okay, that didn't help me. Thanks a lot, Rodback. Okay, well, think about this. If we're going to take, let's say our population is the height of Elmo University students. And we're going to do, we're going to sample 10 people and get their average height. And we're going to get a variance in that, because we're going to do it 100 times, 1,000 times. We're going to get a variance in that average that we get each time. What happens if we sample 500 people? It gets, that variance gets smaller, doesn't it? What happens if we now measure everyone who goes to your university? And then we do it again, and then we do it again, and then we do it again. What's the variance? It's nothing, because we're just calculating the same number over, over, over. Of, of, of these sampling distributions, or of any distribution, of probability mass functions. So if we've got the area between f at 3 and f at 7, this is really this weird distribution. It's a triangle. <coughs> and we want to know the, the probability of getting a value of between 3 and 7. That's something we can do. Right? Now I don't I don't I don't know any variables that are distributed like that, but let's pretend there is one and I've graphed it. So I have three and F at seven. Area underneath the whole thing's one. The area between three and seven is going to give us the probability of the value between three and seven. This is the area under a curve. Again, the important thing with all of this is we're talking about the area under a curve. Well, in the case there with the, the triangles, it's pretty simple. If you were to, how would you find that area? Well, let's see. I know what the area of a triangle is. Right? Half base times height. And now I've got two other triangles that I've cut off. I've got a big triangle, half base times height of that. And I know I've got two smaller ones. I'll find out what those are. I'll take the ones, subtract the other two. Yay, I win. Except that things aren't distributed as triangles. So here's who you're taking calculus. That's cool. Very good. I think I asked you that, right? Is there a reason you took calculus? No. You didn't like it, obviously, did you? No. No. It's okay. I think it's good at it. 
That's, that's, that's as good a reason as any you think, of course. So you were good at it, though? Um, yeah. Like, <coughs> you sure? Yeah, Okay. You took it here? Oh, no, not here. It was in high school. In high school, okay. But even in high school, that, the, the better calculus of the talk was high school calculus. Nobody else here took any calculus? Really? What do they teach people in school now? You just have to show up and you get a B plus, right? And that's how high school works, right? And if you put your hand up once, you get an A. That's basically high school, isn't it? Pretty much, right? Okay. I took calculus. I took first year calculus for math majors in university because I'm an idiot. We had to, it was a prerequisite, they still be at Western, that to take psych stats, you had to take a first year math course. But they had a first year math course for non math majors, which is a good thing. I mean, it's a, it was basically just straight ahead linear algebra, really nice. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm really smart. I'm not taking that. I'm going to take calculus for math majors. Only non math major in the class. Yes, yeah, so that was good. Um, I did okay. The last two months of the course, so a full year long course, I literally understood nothing. <laughs> I just sat there, I don't know. Maybe last month, yeah, March. All of March, I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> All the way up to March, it was like, this is just like high school again, and it was easy. Then it got to the hard part. These kind of series and stuff that I just, I, I got up and left, and the prof knew my name, he knew everybody's name, 200 people, he was a wonderful man, Dr. Kochman. And Dr. Kochman said, Mr. Broadbeck, where are you going? And I said, I, I'm going to the Spoke, sir, which is a bar restaurant. I said, I don't understand this. I'm sorry. I really have tried very hard, and it's not because of you. I've tried very hard, but I don't get it, so I'm wasting your time and mine. He goes, well, good luck then. <laughs> it's great. I went into the final, was going with like a 98, and I got an 80. Should, that should, and the final was worth about 35%. That should tell you how poorly I did in the final. Exam. I was smoking it to that point. And then it was like... Oh, I don't understand any of this. I'm not as smart as I think I am. Calculus is cool because it allows you to find the area under a curve. There's a technique called thinking an integral, right? Right? Right. <coughs> you do all kinds of crazy things like that. Then you spin it, right? You so they get the area of volume of solid. That stuff's really neat. Look at that. If you've never seen that, you look at that and go, that looks like just gibberish. Um, <laughs> All I'm seeing here is that last thing. We're taking the integral of the value of x between 3 and 7. All that means is we're just finding the area under the curve between 3 and 7. And there's a technique to do this. There's a, te a bunch of techniques. You learn to do this. Isaac Newton and Leibniz as well just discovered this property of the universe, that, this thing called calculus. It's really neat, actually. It's really neat. It's the two basic things calculus does is it allows you to determine the uh, slope of a curve at any given point, even if it's curved, which is really cool. And it allows you to find the area underneath a curve. And I just, just to tell you how cool this is and weird how the universe works. If you had like a function like 3x squared, so y equals 3x squared, and you wanted to know what the slope is at any given point, it's the exponent times the coefficient. It's 6x. That's not weird. That just works. This is cool. And then if you look at 6x, you have a backwards. That's, that's how you do, a, that's how you do a, a, an interval, OK? Anyway. So that's a thing one could, one could do. Always reminds me of Seinfeld when George and Jerry are talking about if they burn down the cabin. Well, a man, I couldn't do this, but a man could. I don't know calculus. Well, that's too bad. But and it really is your loss. Knowing calculus is really neat. Because when you figure, the first time, when you do this, did you have this experience with different first principles? You probably did that in high school, right? They, um, the limit, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller of all those little histo like histograms on little bars, and then you go, oh my god, it's the exponent times the That's weird. And it's crazy, and it describes the universe, and it's wonderful. So it really is neat. So it's too bad that you didn't do it at some point. Even just for the hell of it, learn a little bit rudimentary level, it's cool as hell. But it's OK if you don't. Even if you want to go to graduate school and be a professor, you don't have to know calculus. I will bet you real money, Lori, is going to calculus. 
No, I would. I'm pretty sure she does. I think, I think Cheryl did a bunch of math in university. I know Paul did. I did. But I bet you Lori does. Oh, Lori's smart. A little scary. <laughs> I don't know, I don't think she probably, maybe she did. I don't know, I, I didn't run there until she was in, you know, I taught her, right? But she was in second year, so <laughs> I taught her here. There was a time, so we hired her, and then we hired Paul, which, you know, that was a mistake, but then, <laughs> but then later, we hired another guy who's on, um, uh, what do we call it, uh, uh, leave. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like leave. He's at another at university working for now. He may come back, he may not, I don't know. A guy named Dwayne, and I taught him too. But I taught him in Newfoundland. I only, we, so there was a time when we only hired people I taught. But yeah, I taught her. I taught her this course. She hated this course. <laughs> anyway. Well, that's the, that, there's the function of the normal distribution. What a nightmare. Look at that thing. So if you're a graph that y f and x, or y equals 1 over the standard deviation times the square root of 2 pi times e to the negative x minus u over 2 times the variance squared, and you say to yourself, what's e? It's the base of the natural logarithm. Wow. 2.71828 is close enough. It's like pi is 3.141592. Okay, don't worry, I'm never going to ask you this, don't worry, I'm going to do that. Why no. would you put it? Because it's, it drives the conversation. <laughs> it's an interactive <laughs> process. Well, then why would you put it there? So we don't need well, to do that. Well, we don't put anything. And then from now on, I'll just stand here and speak. Okay. So we don't need to do that. Oh, God, no, I don't need to okay. do that. It's good to know. Okay. It doesn't hurt, yeah. Okay, never mind. Um, but don't, don't, don't worry about it. Why did you sound like getting all worked up on that? I mean, it's interesting, especially if you like calculus which nobody in here does, but except me apparently, I have, I have enough passion for it for everyone in the room, so that's good. But if you look at that, if you know a little bit about calculus, that's a horrible interval to take. In fact, it's, it approaches the level of being almost impossible. That's a hard one. So you just take the integral of this function. So let's say you want to find out the probability of having an IQ between 95 and 100 to 7. You just take the integral of this. <laughs> easy. No, that's not easy. It's actually exceedingly hard. I'll just do that. Because this is a nice formula. And it actually is a formula that was discovered by Gaussian. It, 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 it describes the normal distribution. That's great. You know, like, uh, you get a, y equals 3x plus 7. You know, like a function. Well, that's what they, this will give you the normal distribution with a, a given standard deviation and a given mean. It's kind of neat. I think it's neat. OK, it can be made a little easier. If we make the mean 0 and the variance 1, the standard normal distribution, you get a somewhat simpler equation. That doesn't look quite as bad, does it? Because I put a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 in. So it's not quite as evil looking. There's still, it's still pretty nasty. That's still a nasty integral thing. It's still hard to take that integral. It's, it's hard. hard. But one could do it. <coughs> that stops being really super nasty hard. It's just hard. So if we want to find, like I said, though, we want to find the, the probability of having an IQ of between, what did I say, 95 and 107. That's the kind of questions we ask you in, in intro stats classes, isn't it? Which is something no one would ever care about. But, and the reason we use IQ is because we know the standard deviation and we know the population mean because the tests are designed that way. And it's exceedingly rare when we actually know a population mean. Oh, sorry, uh, the variance. But in that case, we do because the tests are designed that way. So that's, that's great. So we can use them. So from first principles, in fact, what you're doing when you're doing that question, not when you're 
So when you're, when you're asked that question, you're coming up with an answer when you took 2126, is you actually are looking stuff up at a table, but you're doing it on the back of people doing calculus for you, who did the probability of any given value of a z distribution, 0 and 1, right? And they then calculated the area under the curve up to that point and past that point. In other words, they did that horrible, nasty integral for you. So when you look up something, not like when you look up something in a z distribution, or for the Americans listening in, a z distribution. You know how like it looks like that and it's all shaded? It's the area under the curve. Because some poor butter did the calculus for you. And then wrote it down on a table because he had a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. And he had a, and he, and he was good at calculus. You should now, every time you look something up in a table like that, think to yourself, thank you, poor unnamed graduate student from like 1820. Well, not quite that old, but you know. Because somebody did this for you. It's pretty amazing if you think about it, right? Like that was just somebody's job. They just pumped out these numbers for these tables. And they did it by hand. Because they learned to do calculus, making them better people than all of you. Well, we're a great part must be. We're the calculus people. I hardly remember any of it. I can look back through a calculus book, and there's savings there. You know, like I can look at it and go, oh, yeah, that. And I can read through it and go, and I remember I did that. I uh, like the product rule and all those things. Like, I, Oh, that's the thing. Oh, you do that? I still have my grade 13 calculus book. Yes, I'm old enough that it was called grade 13. There was an extra grade of school called grade 13. It was awesome. And you took calculus. I took three math classes because, again, a little crazy. I took calculus, algebra, and functions. <sighs> Why I do certain things? And then I go back and, my, and talk to 18 Dave. And say, you know, a few things. First of all, that's a lot of math. But keep taking that. That's good. Then I'd say, like, don't worry so much. <laughs> then I'd say, take some, go lay some bets that one day Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau will run, run North America. Because Justin Trudeau was a little kid, and Donald Trump was, well, he was still Donald Trump. <sighs> I'm so scared. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Okay, this is what we did, what we would do. We would go z equals x minus mu over sigma. 95 minus 100 over 15, right? That's all this is, would equal negative 0.32. And then we'd have the other z, 100, 7 to minus 100 over 15 is, negative, is positive 0.466. And then we'd look these two things up in a z table. And you know how to do that, and I'm not going to do it for you. Right, you did this before, it's not too hard. And this is just like I said about me looking back on calculus. Right now you think, I couldn't do that right now. Yeah, you could if you had to. You really could. It's not something to worry about. I think I just winked. That was weird. I hate when I do that. I don't want to ever be that guy. It's like being this guy. You know? No. I hate those guys. It's kind of guys that go, and this guy. But they're not doing it ironically. Ironically, that's fine. Right. I don't ever want to be that guy. I hate that guy. <sighs> so yeah, you do this. It's not that hard. You can do it. But what you're actually doing, when you find these probabilities, so when it, between the z of uh, negative 0.32 and positive 0.466, you look those two values up, you add them together. But what you're doing when you do that actually is you're finding out the values from this calculus, from underneath this curve, that someone else has done it. So this is why we standardize our, our, our data using the z-distribution uh, to make it, I don't know why I did that, I shouldn't have done that, that's weird, um, to make it normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of one. It's because once we do that, which is what I've done here, it allows us to then use a table where the calculus has already been done for us. That's what, what happens. Okay.
Questions? This is, yeah, please. So that's already been done for us. That's what we look up in the chart? Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. See, what you, you look up, uh, was it negative 0.310 over there? No. Uh, yeah. So negative 0.32 and positive 0.466. And those two, the, the probability of those two, and then we add those up and we end up with a probability of 0 0.310. That means there's a 31% chance or a 0 0.31 probability that someone, any randomly selected individual, has an IQ between 95 and 107. Right? Yeah, and you're right. We look at, that's when we look stuff up on the table and find out these probabilities. I skipped about nine steps that you would have done last year in 2126. And one of the reasons I did that is I have a calculator that has a, a Z table built into it, and I can just say with this and this, and it does it. It's nice. But you did, it's, <coughs> the, the, the function there is based on some poor bugger doing calculus for you a long time ago. And all it is is just the area under a curve. So 95 to 107. Hey, look, I have a normal distribution right here. No chalk. Chalk's over here. So 95 is about all here. And 107 is about all, let's just say, here. So we're trying to find out that area. That's all we've done. So we added up this half, or not half, but this section to this section. Nothing fancy. Straightforward stuff. Other questions? That was a good question. Clarifying. Very good. Okay. So someone did this calculus for you, some unnamed person. So now you can just look it up at a nice table, a nice Z table. Or you can actually, there's, there's a link on here, um, which suddenly, oddly doesn't work from what I'm doing a presentation, which makes no sense. But here's the link. So it's davidmlane.com slash hyperstat slash z table z underscore table dot html. If you go there, you can actually enter, you can actually enter the numbers. You could have entered 95 to 107, or you could have entered the z values, and it would give you the answer. So you don't even have to do um, to calculate it with z equals x minus v, whatever. It's really straightforward. So in fact, it looks like this. So see, mean is zero, standard deviation is one, right? Between negative 0.32 and positive 0.466, there's the answer. Beautiful. And this David M. Lane guy is a stats prof somewhere. You just put all this stuff online. Good for him. Thank you, David M. Lane. You're a good man. Very useful. And you, you play around with, it says between or outside, whatever, until it looks, until this thing here looks like what we would have drawn in advance. There's a reason you were always told in 2126. Always draw yourself a little picture because it allows you to, it really does help. Alright. Questions? Any questions? You good? Okay, so some conclusions for today. Some poor bugger did the calculus for you is the first thing. I really think it's important for us to honor people that did this work. Because it's hard work they did and it's grunt work. But it's something to remember. I, I would just remember that. Um, if, now we just look it up at a table where we use that, that handy dandy web tool and we're fine. Okay. And it's actually not that scary. You actually already knew how to do this. All the stuff I just talked about led up to doing a problem, a kind of problem you would have done in about the third week of 2126 last year. Maybe the fourth week. Or last term. Maybe when you took the last term. So really, it's not something to be too frightened of because it's the stuff you would have done in intro stats very recently, right? 
But now you know why it works. Now, I don't know if you were taught it that way or not, but from what I understand a little bit, but knowing that it works in a certain way and it makes sense that it works and it isn't magic, I think is kind of an important thing. Questions, comments, kudos, criticisms, anything with a hard K sound, characteristics, crap, <laughs> cool, criminality. It's getting weird. We'll stop the video. Uh, YouTube will probably take take it down now because.